Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today, our guest is Ellen Malcolm, founder of Emily's List. Thank you for joining us. You're here in Santa Fe as a guest of the Women's International Study Center, and we only have you for a brief period of time, so I'm so happy you made the time to come and join us today. Well, thank you, Loreen, and I have to say you have the most beautiful state capital I've ever been in, and I can't wait to spend a few minutes walking around after we talk. There's six million dollars worth of art here. It is just beautiful. Um, you have written a book called When Women Win, Emily's List and the Rise of Women in American Politics. I have to disclose something. I am a woman, and <laughs> women in politics is a very important issue to me. But you you have been one of my heroes for a long time because you took, you saw a problem, and you solved it in the most unique, fresh, amazing, and successful way. So first, tell me a little about your background, and then tell us who or what is this Emily who has this list? I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, in a very Republican family. Went off to college, a nice women's college in Virginia, uh, not political, and I became active because of the Vietnam War. And uh, in 1968, I worked for Jean McCarthy as a you know volunteer. So uh, I felt the burn uh, 1968 version and started knocking doors in Philadelphia and, and talking to voters, and I just became hooked. I love politics. And I was a child of the 60s. I wanted to make a difference. I, might, I wanted to make the world a better place, and I thought our generation had some real different ideas. So it was a very exciting time. Interestingly, Bill and Hillary Clinton are the same age, so we all came out in that period of incredible political energy, and the three of us decided to work inside the system to try to make it better. So that's how I got into politics, uh, but it wasn't until the Equal Rights Amendment fight and my work at the National Women's Political Center in the 70s that really made me understand women's uh, issues in a different way and the importance of that. Uh, and so from there, uh, with a group of friends that I had met in the Equal Rights Amendment and fights for women's things, uh, we realized that women weren't getting elected to office, and we decided we had to do something about it. A lot of people have looked at a problem and decided to do something about it. You really did something about it. How did it start? It began uh, because we had helped a woman named Harriet Woods run for the United States Senate in 1982. And the old boys network of the Democratic Party never believed that Harriet could win. They didn't give her any money. Uh, she was actually uh, moving ahead in the polls and because she ran out of money, she lost the race. Uh, and we were furious, like why didn't they come and support her? And it was a very close result and they missed an opportunity. So there'd never been a Democratic woman elected to the Senate in her own right, and we were angry. Let's just take a minute. Let's look at the, 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 the political landscape in terms of gender. So you, you said in her own right. There had been a few women lawmakers who were spouses of a deceased right. or retired lawmaker. So they hadn't been elected in their or own right. Or they were appointed because the governor really wanted to run for the Senate and there was only a short term left. So they put the woman in there to hold the seat. Right. Yeah, right. But no woman had worked her way up, had had a, uh, an intentional career in politics and worked her way up, as all, most senators do, uh, to become a United States senator. So in 1985, when you started Emily's mm -hmm. List, there were two women in the Senate. They were both Republicans, That's and right. they were not hadn't been elected. Was no, they that, had been elected. Okay. 
Uh, but there had never been a Democratic woman uh-huh. elected in the history of our country in her own right. I mean, it's kind of shocking now. Yeah. You, you look at the Senate and you think, oh, there were all those women there. 1985, no Democratic woman had ever been elected in her own right. So tell me what you did about this. Well, we were angry. And you know how it is. You get angry and you get motivated and you want to do something. And we had a pretty simple concept. We thought if we could just tell our friends that we had met through all our national equal rights work, uh, we could tell them who was running for the Senate and encourage them to write checks uh, to the candidates that they like. So we wanted to empower women and show them how they could make a difference and give them the information because don't forget, this is back before the internet. And so you could read, you know, if you lived outside of uh, the big cities, you could subscribe to the New York Times or something, but you basically didn't even know who was running, much less who had a chance. So we were going to be like the political staff and tell folks uh, what they were running. But what we also were going to do, and this is the most powerful part of Emily's List, we essentially reinvented political fundraising. Because up to that point, PACs, political action committees, would raise the money for themselves and the board in Washington or somewhere would make a decision and they'd write a check and the most a PAC could give was $5,000 per election. So it was a real ceiling on what they could contribute. Well, we said our women need more than that if if anybody's going to take them seriously. So we asked our members to write checks of $100 or more to candidates that we recommended. So as I would say in the first election, we supported Barbara Mikulski running for the Senate. If a 1,000 of us wrote a $100 check to Barbara Mikulski, we could raise $100,000 as opposed to the five or the 10000 we could give as a PAC. So it's PAC versus what you call the donor network. The donor network. But who was in that network, and how did you first get the word out? I invited about 25 friends to my basement, and I said, bring your Rolodex. And we wrote up a letter about our concept of Emily's List and the donor network and what a difference we could make if we all wrote checks to candidates. And we asked my friends to address it to friends that they had, write a little short note on the bottom, say, this is a great idea, hope you'll join and sent them out. We sent out about 450 letters that night and got started getting checks back from the first members of Emily's List. 450 letters. We're now 3 million members strong. Oh, so oh. Uh, it really made a difference over the years. And, and uh, most importantly, in 1986, Barbara Mikulski won her Senate race and became the first Democratic woman elected to the Senate in her own right. A great woman, an absolutely oh, yeah. a great woman. Finishing up this year, this is her last term, she's retiring. So she's been in office ever since then, chair of the Appropriations Committee, one of the most powerful, respected members of the Senate. But didn't she say at your 30th anniversary party for Emily's List that she was not going to run for her sixth term, that she was had the choice of either raising money or raising hell, and she was going to take the Which ladder. is vintage, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Okay, what does Emily stand Who is Emily, and what, do, what does the word Emily stand for? Well, let's go to the problem of what women were facing. I told you about how Harriet Woods and nobody believed she could Mm -hmm. win. Her story was something we heard over and over again. Women would go to the establishment, the Democratic traditional funders, and they'd say, you know, I want to run for Congress. My congressman's retired. I'm in the state legislature. I have a political base, a track record. I'm ready to run up the next step for Congress. And the guys would sort of sit back and puff on their cigars and they'd say, you know, you can't win and we're not going to give you any money. And of course, because they never gave them any money, the women couldn't win. So we decided what we needed was early money. If we could be these political venture capitalists, come in early, raise some money for the women, then maybe the establishment would take them seriously. And Emily reflects our commitment to raising early money. Early money 
is like yeast. E M I L Y. E M I L Y. We make the dough rise for oh, our women. I just, I love it. I, I love it. And you did make the dough rise. We sure did. We ended up raising about 150000 for Barb in that uh, critical first Senate race. She was a case study for early money. She was uh, 10, 20 points ahead in the public polls. And when she went to the Democratic Party, they said, you're not going to win because you can't raise money. This nice congressman from a suburban district is going to raise all the money. And so when she showed them that, in fact, she could raise as much money as her opponent, all of a sudden the guy said, oh my goodness, she's way ahead in the polls. People seem to like her. She's got all and this money. lo and behold, she can raise money. We better get yeah. behind her. The other guy's money dry, dried up and she won handily yeah. in both the primary and the general election. So the early money established her as a realistic candidate that went on and won. So it gave her credibility. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. in that, it's really the ultimate democratization of the democratic process. That's right. And That's right. all these individual women voting with their checkbook. That's exactly right. Yeah. And you know, in those days, women didn't have any political power. They weren't used to writing checks to candidates. And so women began to understand that when they got behind women, not that they were a big fat cat, you know, they weren't the Koch brothers, but if we had a lot of people writing smaller checks, we could have as much influence as the fat cats. And what a great feeling that was. I mean, people would just, they got the concept, they were excited, and they started making a significant difference. And this is one of the things about our gender is that we are known for working together. That's right. And, and, it's and a very feminist way of looking at the political process. And boy, does it work. Yes, yes. So you went from maybe 25 at the beginning to... How many now? Three million now. Three million members now. Right. And how much money have did you are you raising, for example, in this political season, this current one? Wow, it's hard to say. I, I think we'll probably raise over fifty million easily. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it's pretty astonishing. And what's even more wonderful is the results of electing all these women. There had never been a Democratic woman elected to the Senate. We've added 19 Democratic women senators. Uh, we've added 11 women governors, Dem Democratic governors. And the House, we started doing House races in 1988. There were 12 Democratic women in the entire House of Representatives. There were only 11 Republican women, so 25 out of 435. Emily's List has helped add 110 women, Democratic women, to the House of Representatives. So it has been a sea change for women in politics. I might add, too, over 700 local and state offices held by women. Absolutely. Yeah. Here in New Mexico right now, we're involved with your wonderful Maggie Toulouse-Oliver, who's running for Secretary of State, uh, a number of down-ballot races. So as we got bigger and had more resources, we were able to do training and helping women get started in politics and, and make small contributions to help them. We're speaking today with Ellen Malcolm, who is the founder of Emily's List. Um, you were named one of America's most influential women by Vanity Fair, one of the 100 most important women in America by Ladies Home Journal, one of the women of the year by Glamour, and most valuable player, MVP, <laughs> by the American Association of Political Consultants. So people noticed that you really created something out of nothing. You know, this is what I really want to acknowledge about you. Nobody had done this before, especially not for women. And well, you know, thank you very much. It, what is interesting about Emily's List, when you look at the political system, and it took me a while to understand this, most political organizations do not really care about electing people, winning elections. They have a legislative agenda, the PACs that I mentioned they, for the most part, are affiliated with issue organizations, whether it's the corporate interests or even the advocacy interests like Planned Parenthood and the Sierra Club. But those organizations aren't in the business of trying to help people win elections. 
So Emily's list, as we grew and started training people to work in campaigns, recruiting and training candidates, having conversations with women voters to go to the polls, all the things we do now uh, are very unique in the political process. For many years, the Democratic Party didn't even do those things, which, of course, gave us a great opportunity to go in and help women and move them forward in the political system. So we had to invent a lot of who we are and what we do. Uh, and it was a wonderful adventure for me and wonderful to see the results. So you were head, you were founder and president for, for from up until 25 years, right. And that must have been hard, but you have a wonderful, wonderful person, and you get to you know lay your burden down a little bit and enjoy, warm your hands at the fire of what's going on. But what I love about your book, When Women Win, it is like a political drama. It's a gripping political history, but it is a cat bird seat. It is a front row seat to some of these dramas. And you look at our political history, there have been landmark things. The Anita Hill. That's right. Hearings. There's one woman and a woman of color and all mm -hmm. male to, they had no idea what she was talking about. It was such a it was circus. the Thomas Hill hearings was one of the most extraordinary political events in the history of our country I think it had everything in it it had drama it had politics it had power it even had sex yes I mean <laughs> it was phenomenal uh, basically Anita Hill accused the Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment now in those days women didn't talk about sexual harassment. As women were in the workplace, it was sort of like the Mad Men television show. Women couldn't talk about it. They felt it was their problem to deal with. It was their own secret drama that they had to deal with when men were acting inappropriately with them. So for the first time, Anita Hill came out publicly and said, this happened, and it was like the floodgates opened. All of a sudden, women were saying to their friends, did you have problems with so-and-so? I certainly did. What did you do? You know, changing jobs, uh, trying to make light of it, trying to stay away from the boss and never be in by yourself with him. It was just phenomenal. So women had a very different understanding of what Anita Hill was talking about than men did. The men were all into the, you know, Charlotte Draper kind of pat them on the back end, whatever, uh, thing. They couldn't understand what the big deal was. And so you had this gender difference on an important issue. And there was Anita Hill with 14 white men on the Senate Judiciary Committee. The Republicans went after her. They made her the bad guy. And women were furious. Where are the women? Why aren't there women there basically talking about what it's really like for women in the workplace? Well, of course, there weren't any women. Yeah. There were two women in the United States Senate. And so this political energy to elect women to the Senate, uh, to make sure we were represented, just took over the 1992 elections. At the same time, the other issue where women were not represented was women's health issues, neither in insurance or when there were hearings. Weren't, weren't there hearings about women's health issues that had all men on them? Oh, all the time. Yeah. There still are recently. Yeah. The Republicans do that periodically, and they have these House committee hearings, and they don't uh, have any women on the committee, and they bring in people that agree with them, and so there's no other perspective. But women were furious, and uh, as uh, Dianne Feinstein ran for the Senate in 1992, and you know when she was talking about there were only two women in the Senate, uh, had a great line. She said. 2% uh, is great for low-fat milk, but it's no good for equal representation. Oh, good. And wasn't that the year of the woman? That was the year of the woman. Yeah. And Emily's list went from 3,000 to 24,000 members because we became the go-to place if you wanted to elect women to the Senate. 
We added four new Democratic women to the Senate, including Carol Mosley Braun. Uh -huh. We added 20 Democratic women to the House. Remember, in 1988, there only were 12, so we added 20 in one election. It was phenomenal. Um, they say that it was you and MLS that broke up the old boys club, the, you know, the, the network that politics had been. And I, I don't think they really saw it coming. Now, internationally, in 1980, Iceland had the first democratically mm -hmm. elected woman leader. And after that, internationally, there was Golda Meir, there were, I mean, there, Margaret Thatcher. There were just lots of women leaders. But somehow in our country, it was really, really slow. But through your work, you really opened up the floodgates. So we're, we're looking at our American history from a gender perspective, and we have to say that there was a member of Emily's List who was a Republican who went and tried to do that for the Republicans. She had a, right. a group called WISH. WISH List, Women in the Senate and House. Uh -huh. uh, she came to me and she said, do you mind if I do this? And I said, no. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to do that because they were moderate Republican women. They were in favor of uh, women's health issues. And as you might imagine, the Republican primary just pushed them out. They had a very difficult time uh, getting women through the primary. They were really stru uh, stuck with this uh, intransigence, really, on women's health rights. And uh, so they never were able to be as big as we were. But, you know, if you look now at the Congress, we're used to seeing women there. But the truth of the matter is the women we see are Democratic women. Democratic women are about a third of the Democratic caucus right now. On the Republican side, when we began in doing House races, Republican women were 5% of the Republicans in House. They're now still under 10%. So nine out of 10 Republicans in Congress are men. Women are not in the Republican caucus. And it's a scandal. It's something that needs to be talked about. And, and I think, you know, I don't agree with Republican women on a lot of issues, but I think it's very important for their party to have a representation of women. And I think it would help them understand issues like women's health better. And I think it would help them be more responsive to uh, what are the real issues that families are dealing with right now. And in the case of the Republican-controlled House, the old saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. That's and, right. And, and women's issues have been on the menu in, in a kind of scary, yeah. non-scientific way. But right. you know, that, that's, that's for another show. Um, now, you have been working with these women to break through the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Now there's one ultimate glass ceiling. There's a big one left to go. Right, and so you are trying to elect a woman president, namely Hillary Clinton. That's right. And uh, we're you know a few weeks before the election, so we'll see. But what I'm concerned about, we found out after Barack Obama was elected, elected there was this undercurrent of racism that just seemed to blossom. Would we have an undercurrent of misogyny? We can see it in the campaign. Oh, yeah, I, The absolutely. other candidate is so misogynistic, it just kind of right. would recoil, calling women pigs and slobs and interrupting mm -hmm. and talking over them like they just don't exist. So are you fearful that there'll be a, a blossoming of this unconscious misogyny? Not that it's anything you can't handle. Well, I think one of the unfortunate parts about Donald Trump's candidacy is he's given permission to a lot of racist, sexist attacks. His comments, his public comments about women, as you point out, have been horrific. His treatment of women have been terrible. <clears throat> and I think that does give permission. So I do think that there will be um, a real conflict and an opportunity really for the country to go back and understand what is we do we think about women in our society are we equal partners uh, or are we just going to be judged on our bodies and our appearance 
Um, so there are a lot of issues to deal with. Um, but first, we got to get Hillary there. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the main issue and what I'm doing here today, as well as having a wonderful event with WISC, is talking to some of the Hillary activists here. Uh, because we need to get the vote out. And I think we all recognize this is going to be a very close election. And I really hope everybody gets out and votes because it's important about where this country, which direction are we going to go in? Are we going to work together to solve problems? Or are we going to pit each other against each other and basically have an angry, divisive society? You know, Gloria Steinem has said, first we had to fight for the right to vote, and now we have to fight for the right to be voted for, and now it's turnout. You know, we cannot have yeah. disaffected. Women are very active, and once they put their mind to something, they will they will go for it, but um, we can't have that fatigue of, you know, like, oh, it won't make any difference, because you yourself have proved what a difference can be made. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, women are good at voting. I mean, we're typically about 53 percent of the vote. Yeah. But we really have to get out in this election. It couldn't be more important. It's on the issues. It's on the uh, president and how they are going to value women and families and children. Uh, and how people in elected office are really going to understand what's going on with today's families. It's shocking to me that in the past 30 years, we have really changed the dynamic of American families as women have gone into the workplace. Families need the income coming in. And most families, the women's income is an important part of being able to sustain the family economically. But we've done so little to readjust uh, support systems. And that's why Hillary's so active on issues like paid family leave, paid sick leave. Uh, you know, there are emergencies, and families need to be able to cope with those, and we need to have policies in place that help them. And we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. I wanted you to tell some of the stories from the trenches here in this book, but people can get the book and read it. It's called When Women Win, Emily's List and the Rise of Women in American Politics. You end your book with saying, when women win, we all win. We all win. And you, em uh, Emily, <laughs> Ellen Malcolm, are one of the people who have helped us win. And I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your history and your efforts and your heart with us today. Thank you. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.